Hey, welcome back to the V8 Jeeps channel. I'm Scrib, and as you know, it's my 2002 Jeep Grand Cherokee WJ Project LSXWJ. Today we're working on putting on a brake proportioning valve. Uh, we are replacing every single part, piece, and component of the braking system on this vehicle, refreshing everything, and we're also eliminating the anti-lock brake system. That would be the reason for the proportioning valve. Now I am no expert on proportioning valves. Did a little bit of research. Uh, I think I got what I probably don't need, but it's gonna function. You got a couple different options. Uh, one option you have is one like this here. Gives you a front and rear input, not, or front and rear input, rear output, two front outputs for your left and right front brakes. Of course, with the rear in most vehicles is gonna be a single brake line going to the rear. And that's what we've got here. The knob here, that allows us to adjust how much rear braking we have versus the fronts. So that is something that once the vehicle's together and driving down the road that we're gonna have to fiddle with a little bit to dial it in and get it working the way we want to. And I suppose uh, it gives us some adjustability for different types of conditions. Never really had a situation where I've thought, oh, I need more front or rear, at least not off-roading, but we'll see what happens. There is another variation uh, like this one here, where basically you run a line straight out of the rear uh, output on your master cylinder, you run it through here. Same difference, gives you adjustability to dial in the rears versus the fronts. Uh, there's a lot of differences in a lot of vehicles and how much front to rear braking is applied. From my experience, which my experience is based on servicing a lot of vehicles and what end of the vehicle we're doing brakes on first, I do find a lot of SUVs and a lot of Jeeps seem to go through rear brakes before front. So I think it's pretty common for a vehicle like this, a station wagon, if you will, trail rated minivan, whatever you guys want to call them, uh, where heavier in the rear vehicles get a lot more rear brake than uh, like a passenger car or a pickup truck that is lighter in the rear. It is pretty common, I believe, on a lot of pickup trucks that they have an adjustable proportioning valve that's related to the rear suspension. So as the rear suspension compresses, which of course requires weight, then it has an arm that would go to the proportioning valve and it does some form of adjustment to give it probably more braking for having a bigger load on the vehicle. In our case, like I said, we're using this one here. This one's from Willwood. Uh, why did I pick this one? I don't know, this one looked like the, it was gonna be the best for our situation. It did come with a bracket. Uh, the bracket technically is designed to be used with a Willwood master cylinder. We didn't go that route. I'm not looking to try to buy master cylinders that may not fit or to go any further than necessary. So we're just running a brand new WJ master cylinder. When I say we're using all new brake components, I mean it, uh, brake booster, master cylinder brake calipers, all the brake lines are gonna be replaced. And we also got some braided stainless steel extended brake hoses here from Iron Rock Off-Road. Uh, they're longer as well. Strange thing is on their website, nowhere do I find where they label the extra length of these. But these are very clearly longer than the front one, than the original ones. Now, of course, they're gonna be stronger being stainless steel as opposed to rubber. Uh, but that's the route we're going to take with this. This is the one for the rear. As far as uh, how we're attaching everything and running it up through the body or through the chassis, something we're going to figure out when we go. Today, the number one job we're doing here is working on installing this proportioning valve onto the master cylinder and running lines from the master cylinder to the proportioning valve. All right, so one thing we're gonna show you here is here's the new master cylinder brake booster. Uh, the Willwood kit came with a bracket right here. It's gonna be really hard to see because everything's black. Uh, should be plenty of light. This bracket, like I stated earlier, is technically intended for using it with the Willwood master cylinder, so that's how it's fit. Uh, one thing I ran into immediately is that it's too low. So the bottom of the proportioning valve is too close to the top of the fender right here. So I've already gone and had to modify it, change the whole location, move the holes down, which moves the bracket up. And we also had to do some grinding down here on the bracket to get it to clear the bottom of the master cylinder. 
But now that we've got that in place, big thing we got to do here is get the proportioning valve installed. And we're going to have to run the little lines to go from here to the input ports on the top of the proportioning valve. Uh, we're very well aware that once the proportioning valve is on here, we'll show you here in a minute when we install it, that it is very close to the top of the inner fender well. And there is going to be some adjustments that take place once we get to the point of running the brake lines around the vehicle. But at this point, job number one is to make these little lines that can't that go from the master cylinder to the brake proportioning valve. Now, we'll show you here, over here in the box, that it did come with lines. They were made for that. One of them I already cut apart to get the fittings off. Uh, these would go from the master cylinder to the proportioning valve here. But again, that is if you're using all Willwood stuff. And besides the fittings, the spacing everything none of it's right so we've already got some fittings over here on the master cylinder out of a bulk fitting kit see those right there it's going to be 3 16 line and we're going to have to flare everything do some bends run them to the proportioning valve make it all fit and then once that part's finished then it's time to put brake lines throughout the vehicle now, if you've ever had to replace or make brake lines for a vehicle, you find, I'm sure you have found that it can be a pretty miserable process. Uh, between some of the places you got to run the lines, cutting out the old lines isn't bad because you can just cut them into pieces, remove them out of the way, but then you've got to feed in new line, bend and shape and form everything to the bottom of the vehicle and make everything fit. It can be pretty, pretty damn miserable. Uh, throughout the years, of course, we've always used some form of steel line, you know, like these. And, of course, that's been the standard. Steel also rots out. Uh, a lot of you folks watching this that don't live where I live, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Brake lines usually rot out in uh, wet, humid climates. But in the Rust Belt here in the Midwest, where we use salt, these things go to crap bad. Uh, one thing that I find here, we service cars all day, every day for a living where I work, and it's the cars that people don't wash that we seem to seem the mo see the most issues with. Uh, a lot of people just don't understand what that salt does. A lot of people think, oh, it's 20 degrees or 10 degrees outside, I can't wash my vehicle or get it wet. And they just leave that salt and mud and road grime on there, and it just eats away through the years at the lines. Another thing that we see pretty often is where there might be snap clips on the body where they snap into place or some kind of P-clamp or whatnot that wraps around and attaches the line to the chassis. We'll find that that little spot right there will hold a bunch of salt and hold a bunch of crap and they'll rot out and leak from those spots. It happens with fuel lines and other steel lines on the vehicles. One of the greatest blessings to man, at least in my book, that comes down to when you're doing brake lines is a new copper, newer copper, brass, whatever this is, brake line material. Uh, this stuff is very flexible, very easy to work with, a lot different than working with the steel. Which as you see with the steel, the steel is pretty hard and rigid. Yes, you can bend it, but it doesn't form the same as the copper. So some people call it cheating, but pretty much at our shop, any vehicle that we have to make brake lines for, we're using this material. And we haven't had any problem with it. Myself as a technician, I've used this for years, and it's all worked out pretty well. So we're gonna get a couple little straight sections on here, off here, sorry. And we're gonna mount our proportioning valve onto the bracket at the master cylinder and start figuring out what little bends and stuff I'm gonna have to do to make this work. I do have a small little bender here or actually a pretty decent good size bender for more of a chassis type job. Not really sure how I'm gonna bend these perfectly to make everything fit, but we're gonna start out with making the ends that go onto the master cylinder and flaring everything to get them attached and do some measuring from that point, bend them how necessary, and get them attached to the top of the proportioning valve here. Uh, one thing we're going to use is I have this kit that I actually haven't ever used yet that is a hydraulic flaring tool kit. 
Uh, this kit, kit here I got from my local Cornwell guy. It is not a Cornwell tool, it's master cool. I've used these at other shops in the past, and this is a pretty badass kit. Uh, there's pretty much everything inside here to make any kind of flare you would ever need, uh, as well as trans lines, fuel lines, and so on that you got a flare at the end, uh, keep on a hose or whatnot. Uh, this kit allows you to do all that. Um, we could use just a standard flaring kit, especially with this copper line. Uh, the copper line flares so easy, which also makes it easier to seal when you tighten it down and thread everything in. So I don't think we're gonna have a lot of problems, but we're gonna use this kit, give it a whirl, and get the ball rolling. One thing we're going to want to do here is straighten this out a little bit. I have absolutely no idea what you call this tool here. Um, this tool has a whole bunch of roller wheels and such in it. See if you can see that. Um, you feed the line in the middle right there and you run it back and forth and it straightens the line out. We'll show you that here. Uh, a lot of you married guys, you should have this figured out pretty easy. So just run it back and forth, get it all straightened out. Look at that, that's about as straight as she's going to get. I do have another one over there. Uh, this is some stuff I borrowed from a coworker. I don't know if that one's a little bit tighter. That's better sometimes, but I'm pretty happy with where I ended up with this here. So this gives us a pretty good piece to go on. We'll cut it off on the end here and start making our little pieces. All right, so to cut these lines off, we are going to use a little tool like this here. Uh, we'll get closer to the camera and show it to you. Well, it's for cutting pipe and brake line and so on. Uh, it's got a little cutting wheel right here that you can see. I don't know how well you can see that. A couple little rollers right here. And the line will go inside here like this. Tighten her down. And at that point, get it kind of snug, not too much to where you crush it. And then you just turn it. Uh, they have different styles of these. Uh, one thing with this one here, it's pretty manual. You got to turn the knob a little bit as you cut through. Uh, keep the pressure maintained. But you just keep running around here. Give it another little twist. And eventually it's going to cut right through this line and give you a pretty clean uniform cut there. Um, some of these take <laughs> go a little more quicker than others. But we're getting there. So... Let's keep running her around. They have some pretty good ones that do a uh, ratcheting thing. Oh, there we go, we've got through. You see that cut, uh, pretty nice uniform cut there on the end of the line. Uh, especially here on the piece that we're gonna use. That's not too bad. Uh, like I was saying, they do have a different style. Uh, this one here that belongs to my coworker. This one technically is very similar to the one we just showed you. Lay the line in there, snug it down. Now this one here is spring-loaded, so you can set the knob, put it fairly tight, and this ratchet, so when it works properly, this one's been around, so it's kind of sticky. But then you can just do that and just ratchet that around, and the spring keeps the pressure on the cutting wheel, and it will cut this off pretty similar to what we just did. So we've got this piece here uh, while we're at it. Might as well cut out another one. Uh, these are probably going to have to be trimmed again because these aren't at any particular length. We're just going to start out with flaring the end that goes to the master cylinder. And then we'll figure out the rest of it and all the fitment and everything from there. So we'll get this one cut off. And then we're going to bust out the flaring kit there, figure out the fittings that we need for that. And yeah, that one went a lot quicker. Uh, we'll figure out the fittings, the fittings that we're going to need for that. Flare a couple lines, attach it to the master cylinder, and start figuring out what bends we've got to do to get to the inputs on the proportioning valve. All right, well, we've got one line made, and boy, was that not fun. So I actually cut up the original, one of the original lines that came with the uh, proportioning valve, reflared it, and got her installed. If any of you guys are familiar with uh, using hard lines like this, whether it's trans lines or 
various other types of cooler lines, whatever it may be, brake lines, is getting both threaded ends to go in together. You could be a smidgen of a smidge off and getting the threads to line up can be miserable. So I saved you all that process, uh, just getting in this line. Yeah, it looks like nothing, eh? No, it was a uh, real pain in the ass to get that to go together. So I've already made one here that goes from uh, this port to here. It was too short, so we made another piece. And one thing we're gonna talk about that's real common that a lot of people do, big mistake, is take a bunch of time, make some flares, and not put your fitting on. Some of the nicest flared ends I've ever made didn't have a fitting on them. So didn't make that mistake this time. Biggest pain in the ass, uh, pardon my language, is getting this thing bent without kinking it. And same situation as that little 90 degree one there on the front is gonna be getting two different threaded portions on a hard line to thread in and fit right down to the millimeter of a millimeter or whatnot, uh, it's, it's a frustrating process. Now this one here is the copper. The one on the front there is stainless steel that came with the proportioning valve like we talked about. So this hopefully should be a little bit easier. Uh, again, I made it about a half inch longer than the first one that I made, and hopefully that gives us enough flexibility. Main thing again is bending it without kinking it. Uh, I actually used the handle from my bench vise to curve a couple of the bends around it. But you get to a point where you're so darn close that you try to just get a little bit more on there and you end up kinking it. And that of course affects the flow and we can't have that. We gotta have full pressure and everything be able to pass through here to stop the vehicle, especially with the power we're gonna be running here. But we're gonna go over there, try to get this thing installed, do a couple bends. Probably not gonna have it on camera because it's not the day that I wanna teach a bunch of you young folks some new words that you've never heard. So I'm just gonna get at this, get it bent up, try to get it fit, and then we'll show you the final product. All right, well, that was not fun, but here's where we're at. Uh, I've got two lines made for this. That's all attached and on there. This one here has uh, slightly got a little bit of a kink there that I'm not happy with. I might have to make something else. What a miserable process. Not my forte doing that. But next step, we're gonna have to start making the lines. Uh, one thing I've gotta do is probably gonna have to put on the front brake calipers, run all the brake hoses so we know where those are gonna be routed and then use those as a starting point or an ending point or when we build off the bottom of the proportioning valve as you here. see and as i've shown we've got three lines that got to come off the bottom here uh two fronts in the rear it's not as tight as it was so i think i'm going to be able to do all this without doing anything with the inner fender cover or inner fender well here um i think i think we're going to be in pretty good shape uh we did end up getting a kit um Dorman Products does make a pre-bent brake line kit. I went ahead and got that. I don't think that it's going to do the trick for us. Uh, main reason for that is they all begin and end at the ABS control unit that's not there anymore. So we're probably going to end up making our own lines for the whole vehicle, but we'll see how everything goes. I've just got them all thrown inside the Jeep here. They're all in bags. Uh, they're stainless steel lines. Uh, I don't have the box or the part number right here, but these are all pre-bent to fit on the vehicle. And there's a lot of situations where these pre-bent brake line kits from Dorman work pretty awesome. Uh, the most common vehicles at the shop that we do brake lines on are GMC Sierras and Chevy Silverados, Tahoes, Yukons, any variation of those things. Uh, we do a whole bunch of them. Problem is with the pre-bent kits is they would work real well if the chassis is off the frame, but fitting them in and getting them in between the body and getting all the bends and everything to fit in between things is a lot more work than just using the copper material. So that's pretty much exclusively what we use. But in a situation like this on the WJ where things are accessible, especially in the situation where there's no motor or drivetrain in the vehicle, 
those would be a really good way to go. Uh, in our case, I just think that I'm going to play more hell trying to get them to mount up to the bottom of the proportioning valve there. But I am going to try it before I throw my hands up and go a different route or build my own. Because in this case, they'll fit for the most part up here along the firewall and where they've got to go and down to the brake hoses. The one that goes to the rear, uh, that typically would come up here. The ABS unit typically sits right here and it would come up and bend onto there. I think I might be able to make that fit on there. So we're just gonna have to get at it and see what we can do to make it all work. But I'm pretty happy with what I come up with here so far. And hopefully this does the trick and we have good braking. Uh, any of you guys, I haven't ever seen anything, but if you've ever seen any enlarged brake rotor and caliper kits for these WJs, let me know. I know it's pretty common to use the brake calipers, which are dual pistons uh, and from a WJ and putting them on other Jeeps. Um, I kind of think that they put them on some TJs. Uh, I know that they take the knuckles off WJs and put them on the axles on the XJs. And that allows you to add the WJ brakes and so on. There's probably more to it than just that. I don't have an XJ, so I haven't looked that deep into it. but. Pretty, pretty good braking. Uh, 2002, like March of 2002 and up, they went to an Akabono brand or style brake caliper. Uh, prior to that, the 99s up to halfway, you know, the early part of 02, uh, they used some other brand. It's eluding me right now as to which one it is. But those are known to be an upgrade too. And for what it's worth, if you have the 99, 2001, early 02, the Akabono calipers bolt right on. There's nothing special. You don't need different rotors or anything like that. So it's as simple as swapping out the ones you have at the parts store for the Akabonos. Whatever your core is, your core is, you know, that's on you. But that is a little bit of an upgrade. Uh, it gives you a different style of a brake pad and apparently there's a reason that jeep went to the akabonos and that's definitely the superior route so next step here is start laying down some brake lines and figuring out the rest of that part of the deal too eventually is for the rear end uh the whole iron rock off road Trust. deal uh came with some brake lines because the brake lines got to be ran differently across the truss or under it or in front of it so I really wish I'd have done that while I had the axle out, but I had to get this thing on its wheels and get to get the bottom end cleaned out and so on like we did in the last episode. So I'll have to deal with it on the floor. You know, I can't tow this to the other shop, unfortunately, and uh, do it on a hoist where I can stand underneath it because I don't have any brakes. And when I say tow it, we're a bunch of hillbillies and... Uh, Risk takers around here by towing it, I mean tow strap or whatnot and taking it a half mile down the road down to the other facility. Uh, you have to have brakes to do that. And we're not going to pay a tow truck $175 to tow it a half mile either. So I'll probably have to lay on the ground here and do those. We'll do that in a different episode or the remainder of this one. We're not sure yet. Uh, we're going to move on to the next part of the process here and uh, Try to get some hydraulic system going on for the WJ here.